Chapter Seven of Miss D. Dunmore Bryant by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven: A New Acquaintance. The very next day after her talk with Fanny Kedwin, line dressed Daisy in her one pretty apron of soft plaid gingham that looked like silk and was made to tie at the shoulder in pretty loops that looked as much like ribbon as they could being only gingham and went to call on the invalid lady who was so kind as to need some plain sewing done for her there might have been two reasons for line's choice of an apron she liked to have daisy look pretty in it and besides she made every stitch of it herself if the lady should just happen to want to see a specimen of her sewing it might be convenient fanny kedwin was not at home this at first frightened line who was timid with strangers she turned irresolutely from the door half resolved to go home and wait until fanny could befriend her but the desire to secure the sewing before any one else was found gave her courage and she turned back do you know whether the lady who wanted some sewing done has found anybody yet she asked of the girl in a very much soiled calico dress who had opened the door the girl knew nothing about it and looked as though she would like to say neither did she care but mrs kedwin was waiting at the head of the stairs to see whether she was wanted and now came down a step or two is that caroline bryant come in caroline was fanny speaking to your mother about the sewing i didn't tell her to for i didn't suppose it would do any good your mother said there was so much work in those wrappers and sacks that she could not promise anything else no ma'am said line she can't but i thought perhaps if it was only plain work i might get it to do mother would see that i did it right and i know how to sew pretty well you said mrs kedwin coming down three steps farther down the stairs i'm bound you do you wouldn't be your mother's daughter if you didn't but then you haven't any machine have you child oh no ma'am but fanny thought perhaps the lady would not care if they were done by hand if she wasn't in too great a hurry care i don't suppose she would of course hand work is nicer than machine work but who can afford the time to do it in these days i can said line with a bright little smile for the reason that i haven't anything better to do i mean that will earn money it is getting so late in the season mother thought there would be no use in buying more yarn i can't help with her sewing that is i have done all she likes to trust to me the rest is very particular work but fanny said it was just plain underclothes which were already cut and i thought perhaps so you are willing to undertake plain underclothes by hand are you well there's a difference in girls certainly come upstairs and i'll see what miss webster says she is particular about her sewing i guess but i shall tell her that your mother's daughter ought to be able to suit her it was such a pretty room into which they were shown line had not known that mrs kedwin's house held so pleasant a spot it was not that it was elegantly furnished indeed the furniture was of the plainest just a cottage bedstead with a bureau and washstand matting on the floor but there were the brightest softest rugs laid about on the matting crimsons and browns and pale greens and tints of delicate pink line touched them softly with her foot and felt their thickness and warmth axminsters they were though she did not know it they had followed miss webster in a large packing trunk the week after she had decided to remain at mrs kedwin's not so much because she wanted to be near the little church as because she wanted to help mrs kedwin with the generous price she paid for her board then there were delicate curtains hanging not only at the windows but in all sorts of unexpected places line called them curtains they hid the toilet appointments from sight they drooped in graceful folds over the rows of shelves in the corner where all sorts of pretty knick-knacks were gathered besides the choice books there was even a curtain on the plain little table over by the fireplace at least if it was not neither line nor daisy knew what to call it 
it was not the right shape for a table cover according to their ideas it was long and narrow hanging low at either end but not quite covering the sides line wondered why they did not put it the other way and cover the plain woodwork entirely but admitted to herself that for some reason it looked prettier as it was there were also a few pictures on the walls which daisy's beauty-loving eyes saw at once especially was there one which gave her intense satisfaction a pretty little oval representing a single plump chicken in the act of picking up a choice morsel its name chicken little was traced in rustic letters just beneath it was a very pretty chicken and looked extremely natural it almost seemed to daisy as though she could smooth down one of the feathers which was ruffled a little but her special satisfaction in it grew out of the fact that she had but the day before cut from a stray newspaper a beautiful picture of a fat white goose who seemed to be waddling across the grounds for a set purpose there was such a look of intelligence in its eyes daisy had carefully cut it out and then had been seized with an aesthetic doubt as to whether it was the proper thing to place a goose in the study but now she reasoned if miss webster who had so many beautiful things believed a chicken to be an appropriate picture for her room surely daisy might set up a goose in hers miss webster received her callers with the most gracious smile insisted on their taking seats said she was lonely and in special need of young company and would talk to line about sewing after they were rested a little and had become acquainted line smiled at the idea of being tired with the short walk from her home to mrs kedwin's but grew grave with sympathy as she remembered how impossible it would be for miss webster to take even so short a walk as that mrs kedwin went away leaving them to get acquainted without her having first made line's cheeks flame by saying with energy she's to be trusted miss webster if she says she can do your work why she can mrs bryan's children are to be depended upon every time i often tell my fanny that if she does half the honor to her bringing up that the bryant children do i shall be satisfied there isn't a better woman in the country than mrs bryant and she has a hard time like the rest of us line was glad to see the door close after that it was embarrassing to be talked about in this way even to have their hard times paraded before a stranger miss webster was looking at her with an interested sympathetic smile on her face and she said softly as the door closed it is an honor to have a mother whom people cannot help praising isn't it some way that made everything seem nicer at once to line the flaming color began to die out from her cheeks she looked up and smiled and felt more at ease it was a very pleasant call miss webster told the story of chicken little and why that particular namesake had a place in her affection then she had line hand her a box from the bureau and displayed some brilliant plumage from south american and other tropical birds and told little bits of interesting things about the birds who had worn them until line as well as daisy began to think her the wisest sweetest woman she had ever seen so you know how to use your needle she asked at last when they were beginning to feel quite at home with her yes'm said line simply i know how to do plain sewing pretty well i believe mother taught me when i wasn't any older than daisy and i have helped her ever since when i could i never undertook to do anything quite alone for other people at least not for people who did not belong to our family but i think i could and mother would show me anything i didn't know and you work evenings i suppose after school duties are over the flush began to creep into line's face again i didn't go to school this winter she said speaking low it was not convenient for mother to spare me she has to be away quite often about her work and she is sometimes kept so busy that she cannot do the housework at all so i have that to attend to and besides there were other reasons why i could not go 
she did not propose to tell this stranger that it had reached the point with them where she had no dress suitable to wear to school that the plain dark calico in which she looked so neat and trim this afternoon and was her very best was growing old and must be saved for sunday because there was no present prospect of being able to buy even a six-cent calico it was an undeniable fact that despite the fifty dollars which had come to them so unexpectedly through daisy's letter the bryants were very poor indeed it is all owing to that horrid mortgage ben had explained to line when they talked things over only a night or two before i never understood it until the other day mother said it didn't seem worth while to explain to us as long as there was no way open for us to help more than we were doing now but i wish she had we might have done something more maybe though i'm sure i don't know what what is a mortgage line had asked almost fretfully it seemed to her that they were having more than their share of the burdens of life why it is when you owe somebody and can't pay and you give them a paper saying that if you can't pay at such a time they will have a right to sell your house or your cow or whatever you pick out you know then you have to pay interest on it every year and that counts up like everything give who a paper asked line bewildered by ben's grammar and the wandering of her own thoughts why the man you owe said ben line was generally so quick to understand in our case it is mr jenkins it seems mother owes him a thousand dollars ben had made an impressive pause at this point to give line a chance to take in the magnitude of the trouble father did you know and mother couldn't pay it when it was due but she pays the interest and he lets it run on only he says every time that he can't wait any longer he will have to foreclose that is what they call it when they sell you know so mother is kept in trouble about it all the time poor line had felt that she did not know at all these business phrases which rolled so glibly from ben's tongue were almost as new to her as they were to daisy i don't understand she had said anxiously what have we got that mr jenkins could sell we haven't got anything and she looked about the room with a bewildered though troubled air few as their things were and plain of course they would bring something and it would certainly be very hard to get along without them it's the land said ben gloomily the meadow and the garden and this little shed of a house they are all mortgaged to mr jenkins he could sell them all to-morrow if he took a notion and turn us out into the street and mother is afraid a good deal of the time that he will do it i can see that line's face had grown pale here was trouble indeed but how came father to owe mr jenkins she had asked in great anxiety ben's face had flushed and he had turned away for a moment as though he had no answer for her at last he had said still with his back to her i don't know but i guess at it and i think that is the real true reason why mother hasn't told you and me before you know line that father used to go to mr jenkins's place a good deal once i didn't know it said line sharply how should i no one ever told me what did he go there for rufus told me once ben said after another troubled pause he did not do it to be mean i came upon several of the boys suddenly when they were talking about something and they all stopped then rufus thought that would make me think they did not like me or something of that kind and he explained that they were talking about a man who was beginning to drink a good deal and they were afraid it would make me feel badly so they stopped talking when they saw me i didn't understand that at all and i kept asking questions until rufus had to tell me that father used to drink a good while ago before daisy was born and that is the way he lost so much money and got into mr jenkins's hands i don't believe it line had said angrily i don't believe one word of it i should not think you would let rufus kedwin say such things about your own father ben bryant 
but ben had only looked troubled and had sighed heavily for answer and line ashamed of her words had gone away quickly lest in her trouble she should say something else that was unkind she had cried for an hour and made her eyes so red that she was ashamed to go to the store for molasses and ben had been very patient and kind and had gone himself though he had just reached home after a long tramp and after all line felt obliged to confess to herself that the story was probably true it explained a great many things which had been perplexing to her it made her all the more anxious to get sewing to do to help her mother poor mother so there were special reasons why she was not going to explain to this stranger how she came to be too poor to go to school miss webster looked interested but asked no more questions in that direction instead she turned her attention to daisy are you a little sewing woman too she asked daisy explained that she knew how to make quite a good many things for her dollies and then gathering courage from a look at the sweet face added i tried to make scallops around the bottom of arabella aurelia's dress my other little girl had embroidery on hers and i thought arabella aurelia might like some scallops but i could not cut them because mother's shears were too large for my hands and the little scissors are too dull is that arabella aurelia asked the amused lady pointing to a very little neatly dressed doll in daisy's arms oh no ma'am this is just one of my little children arabella aurelia never goes out with me i love her very much and i would be willing to take her very willing indeed but my sister line does not think she looks suitable miss webster decided in her own mind that this little child woman who had come to call on her was just the oddest morsel she had ever seen but she kept her face properly grave and asked what was line's objection to arabella aurelia daisy looked at line for help but receiving none put aside the fiction so dear to her own heart that the creature in question was real flesh and blood and answered in her grave grown-up tone she is not a truly dolly ma'am she is just the arm of a chair it broke off and couldn't be mended so i had it for my dolly it has no eyes nor mouth nor any of those things but i love her very much i did long before i had any other dolly and i always shall i would make her a scalloped dress if i could the sentence closed with that quaint little sigh which always went to mrs bryant's heart it found miss webster's heart on the instant she hardly knew whether to laugh or cry climb up on that chair beside the table she said after a moment and open that box with the silver clasp i think there is a pair of scissors in it like the ones you need daisy gravely obeyed got on to her knees before the opened box and looked at the gleaming things within her face all in a wonderment of satisfaction silver scissors with gold handles besides other shining things which looked like silver but whose names and uses were unknown to her try the scissors said miss webster motioning line to hand her a bit of cloth from the work-basket just make a pattern of the sort of scallop you mean and let us see if those scissors would do the work down sat the little woman her face taking on the most business-like air and with deft fingers she folded the bit of blue flannel several times and then cut dainty pointed scallops they are lovely she said her fair face flushing they cut down to the very tip edge of themselves miss webster laughed it was impossible not to then i want you to take them to arabella aurelia with my compliments tell her they are her very own but that if she loves you half so well as you deserve she will lend them to you whenever you wish tell her also that i shall feel hurt if she does not call on me as soon as her new dress is done that i may see the scallops with my own eyes End of chapter seven chapter eight of miss d dunmore bryant by pansy 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 Ben's Visit When Line and Daisy came back from their call on Miss Webster, Line had a good sized bundle in her arms, in which were several pieces of work carefully cut and basted, ready for her hand. She felt triumphant, for was not this her first effort all by herself to help support the family? Ben was to go in the evening to get a certain kind of button for which Miss Webster had sent. I think it will be sure to reach me in the afternoon mail, she had said. You can tell your brother to come up to my room, then I can give him whatever other directions I have. I don't want to go up to her room, Ben said, standing irresolute hat in hand. Why can't I just ask Fanny Kedwin to clip upstairs and get the buttons for me? But, Ben, she said you were to come up, and she would give you any directions she might have for me. She can't have many new directions since three o'clock, Ben said discontentedly. It is only five hours since you were there. Besides, Fanny can tell me the directions. I shall get them from her much straighter than I would from Miss Webster, you may depend won't that do mother i just hate to go upstairs why do you my boy oh because a fellow never knows where to step in a woman's room nor how to act it is all full of gimcracks too i shall be sure to smash something or knock down something at least it seems to me that a fellow of your age ought to be able to enter a lady's room and stand by the door a few minutes without doing any very great harm his mother said smiling ben laughed good-naturedly though he looked a trifle shamefaced he knew his mother did not like to hear him speak of himself as a fellow and she didn't like such words as gimcracks neither was she especially pleased with the fits of exceeding shyness which occasionally possessed him as he still stood in apparent irresolution the mother added it is barely possible that she may wish to send a message directly by you since she took the trouble to speak of it at all events it would certainly be courteous to do as she said oh well said ben i'll go up of course if you say so he went away wondering why things which did not trouble girls at all were so hard for boys to do wondering also if mother and line had the least idea how he hated to go up to that lame lady's room and ask for those buttons he puzzled over it all the way to mrs kedwin's why such little things as these were hard and why since they were hard it had to be a fellow's duty to do them it isn't that i'm lazy he told himself or selfish I'd go up nine flights of stairs in a minute if it would do anybody any good. Five minutes more, and with the puzzle still unsolved, he was knocking at Miss Webster's door, Rufus Kedwin standing at the foot of the stairs to make sure that he chose the right door. Come, said a clear, pleasant voice, and Ben, wondering why she did not say, Come in, turned the knob and obeyed good evening said miss webster this is little daisy's brother i suppose would you mind helping yourself to this chair here by the lamp and tell me please which of these buttons you think are the prettier my cousin has sent me two kinds and i can't decide i don't know much about buttons ma'am said ben with an embarrassed laugh as he took the chair indicated and felt that his cheeks were ablaze not don't you know now that there is a certain style of button which you prefer to all others for your collar why yes am he said laughing and wondering how in the world did she know anything about his collar buttons i do like them to be just about right ah i was sure you did that is just the way i feel about my buttons only you see i am never sure which ones will be about right so they give me some interested minutes. Did you ever imagine how many little things a person who cannot take a step has to plan to interest herself with? Can't you step at all, ma'am? Ben asked, intense sympathy overcoming his timidity. Not a step, 
she said with great cheerfulness that is not by myself when my nurse puts both arms around me and lets me rest my weight against her i can walk quite nicely but that you see is pleasanter for me than for her so i don't entertain myself in that way very often i don't see how you can bear it ben said conscious that there was a queer lump in his throat what the not being able to walk why i know so many trials harder than that that sometimes it seems not worth mentioning what would you think if i should tell you it had been the cause of more happiness to me than any other thing in my life you would find it very hard to believe wouldn't you she added smiling at the look in ben's brown eyes i'd believe it if you said so he answered gallantly but i don't see how it could be it seems to me i would be cross and miserable all the while i shall have to tell you a little bit about it she said cheerily i had a little brother the dearest handsomest boy in the world only six years old he was and i was thirteen in the night when my mother was sick our house took fire father nearly lost his life in saving mother who was quite helpless and in the confusion dear little benny was forgotten for the moment by everybody but me i had run to his room which was quite a long way from mother's so his voice would not disturb her morning rest but by the time i had him in my arms and was ready to run the staircase was on fire there was no way of escape but by the window and the fire was making such rapid strides that i felt sure poor benny could not breathe the heated air long enough for them to bring a ladder so i jumped to the ground with him in my arms think what a joy it was to me to be told that i had saved my little brother's life that was the beginning of the happiness nothing was ever sweeter to me than my father's and mother's kisses that morning but i have had a great deal of happiness out of it since couldn't you ever walk again ben asked oh yes i walked for several years but the jump hurt the nerves of the back in some way they kept growing weaker and weaker and at last they wouldn't work any more they felt that they had done enough but my little brother benny is a tall splendid boy now almost nineteen and just as good and brave and grand as he can be he is going to do his work in the world and mine too do it better i dare say than i could myself so you see i have happiness out of it all the time there are very few brothers in the world like mine i couldn't begin to tell you of the number of things he does for my comfort he seems to be always planning something new and nice for me i should think so burst forth ben his embarrassment all gone his eyes glowing with sympathetic feeling i should think he would feel as though he couldn't do enough for you why asked miss webster smiling why because said ben almost indignant that she should ask the question didn't you pretty nearly give up your life for him i should think he would almost worship you miss webster's bright kind eyes were fixed upon him her voice was eager and pleased i am so glad to hear you say this she said it tells me plainly that you are a servant of jesus christ and think no service too much to give to him i wondered if you were when i heard your sister call you ben this afternoon you can imagine that i am especially interested in boys of that name so i thought about it a good deal i am glad to know you do serve him don't you then you should have seen ben's face astonishment dismay extreme embarrassment these feelings followed one another in such quick succession as to almost take his breath away what did miss webster mean what had he said to lead her to make such a mistake as this his eyes drooped before her earnest gaze and he felt ashamed and pained to have to answer her question with a low toned no ma'am oh she said in a disappointed tone i am so sorry to hear that why i don't understand it how can you who understood so quickly what my brother benny felt for me feel other than boundless gratitude and love for your elder brother who gave his life for you 
i thought of course you returned his love how is it my boy why do you not belong to him ben was silent for a few minutes then murmured low something about being too young and felt ashamed of himself while he spoke his reply seemed so foolish too young repeated miss webster in apparent astonishment that is strange benny loved me with all his heart years before he was as old as you and i am sure you must know how to love how is it with that little daisy of yours who visited me to-day you are not too young to love her ben felt more ashamed than before still there seemed to him something to say for his side of the question and he answered sturdily that he always supposed there was more to do than just to love somebody why no said miss webster quickly nothing more than grows out of honest loving service you know your love for daisy does not permit you to sit still and see her suffer when you could do anything to help her that is one form of service then how is it with your mother doesn't your love for her prompt you to obey her directions what sort of love would it be which allowed you to deliberately do that which you knew would pain her or was in any way contrary to her wishes don't you see that honest loving means service to those who need and loyal obedience to those who have a right to command aren't you old enough to love the lord jesus christ and to follow his directions yes m said ben frankly i suppose i am i never thought of it in that way being a christian always seemed to me something for old people or for men and women at least i understand you thought it something too great for young people it is great certainly but it is like some other great things human love for instance take daisy and yourself i know you both love your mother but you can show it by doing for her things which daisy cannot do because her arms are not strong enough yet to the measure of her strength i presume she shows her love in service yes m said ben but even as he spoke he gave a little sigh there came to him a thought of how little he could do to help his mother miss webster studied his face a moment while he stared steadily at the door and winked hard there is very little you would not do for your mother if you could she said gently i feel sure of that what i want to have is a reason why you do not feel so toward jesus christ i don't know ma'am said ben after a moment's thought turning honest eyes on her it doesn't seem so easy to me as the other not by a good deal i am with my mother every day and i know her and can talk with her and hear her talk to me and the other is very different i can't seem to feel sometimes as though there were any such person i mean as though he could hear what i said or cared for me or anything i never thought i was ungrateful but i don't a pause then after a moment of silence you can't make yourself love a person you know ma'am no said miss webster that sort of love would be worth very little but i'll tell you what you can do you can make yourself serve a person suppose you undertake that i don't understand what you mean ben said twisting uneasily in his chair his face growing red why i mean see here am i right in thinking that you admire your mother very much and would like above all things to give her pleasure yes ma'am you are i think my mother is the best woman there is in the world and she has lots of trouble too there is nothing in the world i wouldn't do to help her in a minute if i could then tell me this do you believe your mother would be pleased if her son were a servant of jesus christ if she knew you had joined his army and promised to obey his lead in all that you did and said would she be glad or not there was a sense in which it was very easy for ben to answer this question many and many times had his mother said to him speaking low i long to see my boy a christian and he had always answered either by silence or by a constrained 
i mean to be mother one of these days whereupon she would sigh and turn away she was not given to much speaking on this subject she had not trained herself to speak freely even with her children about it but ben knew none knew better how much such a step as this would please his mother yet he had honestly thought he could not take it something some mysterious process must go on in his heart before he could be a christian he had heard repeatedly the phrase a change of heart he knew that only god could change the heart and without stopping to make this thought consistent with other things he knew he had told himself that some time probably that mysterious change would come to him and then he would be a christian but in the meantime he did not like to think anything about it but miss webster was waiting for her answer he looked down at the floor and spoke low i know she wants me to be a christian then suppose you engage to do this not to love christ mind you as you said you cannot make yourself love him but to obey him to study his book in order to find out what he wants done and then to do it honestly as well as you can are you willing to please your mother by doing this but the bible says we must love him that's the very first thing said ben almost with an air of triumph he had learned the verse in his lesson only the week before thou shalt love the lord thy god with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind he thought miss webster was contradicting herself and getting her logic into a very narrow corner i know it does she answered quickly but you and i are entering into an agreement to do what we can not what we cannot we are both agreed that you cannot of your own power make yourself love god but you can make yourself obey some of his directions what i ask is will you take them up as fast as you find them and live by them why i do said ben sturdily if you mean the commandments and such things do you do you pray my boy i say the lord's prayer generally at night and think of the words and try to order your life by them ben thought a minute no ma'am he said at last looking at her with honest gray eyes i don't believe i think about the words much at all i am so used to them i can't they slip right off my tongue when my mind is contriving some way to do something that i want to accomplish yes i know all about that kind of praying i mean a different kind you are a very honest boy i like that we can understand each other a great deal better on that account let me ask you two or three questions i know you will answer them honestly do you believe that you owe god your love and obedience why yes am certainly then of course being an honest boy you want to give what you owe so far as you can are you willing to follow my rule about it a little while suppose you promise that every morning before you leave your room you will kneel down and pray something like this heavenly father give me a heart that wants to love thee help me to obey thee this day so far as i can for jesus sake and at night instead of saying our father will you say forgive the sins and mistakes of to-day show me plainly what they are and help me not to make them to-morrow will you do this why said ben hesitating while a deep crimson flush spread all over his face i suppose i could but there he stopped he wished miss webster would finish the sentence for him he had not the least idea how to finish it but she looked directly at him and waited i don't want to he said at last that is honest i am glad you own it but for all that i ask you to do it and if i am not mistaken in you you will didn't you tell me you ought my boy ben bryant had never in his life before had so small an opinion of himself he had always rather prided himself on his honesty something in miss webster's tone made him feel as though he was dishonest and mean 
he did not want to make the promise she called for yet he did not understand his own heart enough to tell why neither did he see any honest reason for not doing so at last drawing a long sigh like one who was forced beyond his inclinations he said i suppose i can do it miss webster if you think it will be of any use she smiled on him brightly i am sure it will be of use in your case because i take you to be faithful about anything that you undertake ben went home thoughtful line questioned him curiously what did he think of miss webster what had kept him so long did she say anything to him beyond the directions about the work didn't he think she was lovely some of these questions he found hard to answer he was in no mood to tell what miss webster had said to him he put line off almost gruffly and gave his attention to daisy her face was a study she had retired to the farthest corner of the trim little study and was bent over with her elbow on her knee and her cheek resting on one hand while in the other she held a small box of pennies and one half dime being as ben very well knew all the money she had in the world it isn't enough to do anything with she said at last her voice so sad that it went to ben's heart what did you want to do daisy linda you are not in need of another picture frame so soon surely he gave a glance around the decorated walls as he spoke a new picture a lovely little christmas scene had been mounted but the day before and hung in a conspicuous corner oh no said daisy i was not planning anything for myself i wanted to think of some way to help mother i heard her tell you and line about the money and that she didn't know how to pay it but i have only seventeen cents and that won't do hardly any good at all if i only knew some way to make it grow bigger End of chapter eight Chapter Nine of Miss D. Dunmore Bryant by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine. Do it anyhow. Ben was moving very slowly down the street. The night was cold, and he had his hands in his pockets. He was whistling to keep his courage up. The truth was, Ben was a good deal discouraged, and was also in some perplexity. Something troubled him very much something that he had not told his mother nor indeed anybody else one of the perplexities was whether he ought to do so he hated to get home while his mind was in such a whirl of doubt therefore he walked slowly though it was so chilly in one of the pauses between the rather doleful whistling he was doing came the distinct sound of a tap 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 on a window pane ben stopped and listened it came again tap 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 that is miss webster's window said ben looking up i wonder if she can be tapping for somebody she can't walk and maybe she wants something but maybe it is only the elm branches tapping against the window dear me i wish i knew i'd go up in a minute if she wanted anything but it would be awkward to go and find it was only the elm tree knocking while he waited the street door opened and fanny kedwin looked out ben she said if that is you miss webster says she wishes you would come up to her room she wants to see you it is me said ben without regard to grammar but i don't know what she wants of me do you he followed fanny as he spoke somewhat reluctantly he admired miss webster very much but felt exceedingly shy about meeting with her no i don't said fanny shortly she wants to preach to you i suppose she preaches to us or about us most of the time she is always talking about how young folks ought to do or might do or something i'm tired of her she is just an old maid what do old maids know about young folks i should like to know if it had not been for her mother would have let rufus and me go to that masquerade party to-night i had just the prettiest notion about a dress and it wouldn't have cost much of anything 
mother was almost willing until she went and talked with miss webster and then she said no outright i'm tired of her i wish she would go home i don't care if she does pay more for her board than mother asks by this time they were at the head of the stairs and ben had only a chance to say seems to me you are in ill humor tonight when fanny knocked sharply for him at miss webster's door said in answer to the invitation to enter here's ben bryant ma'am and vanished ben thought it was a very awkward way to introduce him and wished he had coaxed fanny to stay come in said miss webster briskly did you hear my tap tap on the window you didn't think i was a raven did you take a seat you are not in a hurry i hope i have been watching for you all the afternoon i wanted to send daisy a picture a raven repeated ben curiously miss webster seemed always to be saying something to surprise a person out of his embarrassment and set him to puzzling why yes you know the raven came tapping only that was at the chamber door did you never hear the story of the raven how when the gentleman was nearly napping suddenly there came a tapping as of some one gently rapping rapping at the chamber door miss webster's voice was very musical and ben was extremely fond of rhyme he smiled as he said that was what came to me out there on the street only i knew it was on a window but i didn't know what it was i thought maybe it might be the branch of the old elm tapping against the window but it sounded to me like a person miss webster nodded her head just so she said quaintly history repeats itself only you were not napping if you had been you might have said madam truly your forgiveness i implore but the fact is i was napping and so gently you came rapping and so faintly you came tapping that i scarce was sure i heard you oh i heard it very plainly ben said laughing at he hardly knew what but i don't see what it has to do with a raven why it was the raven who knocked at least that is the way the poem runs open here i flung the shutter when with many a flirt and flutter in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore not the least obeisance made he not a minute stopped or stayed he but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door perched above a bust of palace just above my chamber door perched and sat and nothing more ben's amazed look set miss webster off into a merry laugh you should hear the whole story she said some of it is very quaint and some of it is very sad one cannot help feeling sorry for the poor fanciful brain that could get up such a strange conceit and put so much sorrow and despair into it she had for the moment forgotten who her listener was and lost herself in a sorrowful thought of some sort then she came back to ben with a smile i did not mean to compare myself to a raven nor to give you snatches from poe poe what a queer word is that the short for poetry oh no and miss webster laughed again but not unpleasantly that is the name of a famous poet who wrote the poem from which i quoted edgar allan poe and his poem called the raven was one of those which made him famous ben's face crimsoned he began to understand that he had been exhibiting a good deal of ignorance i don't know much about poetry he said humbly nor books of any kind and he sighed of course not miss webster said brightly you are young yet you see and opportunity is all before you i haven't had a great deal of opportunity said poor ben thinking of the school to which he could not go more than you realize i dare say miss webster replied with a wise nod of her head the way to do it is to pick up little bits of knowledge wherever you find them they lie around so loosely all about us only the trouble is we so often go blindfold i don't suppose a day passes but that you and i add to our stock of useful information without realizing it and fail of adding a good many little items that we might just because we do not realize or recognize them 
ben looked interested and puzzled i'm sure i don't know where mine are i must be blind most of the time i don't see any of them really have you not learned a single new thing today think not a thing ben said promptly then hesitated and laughed a little or i don't know i did learn that dried peaches had gone up two cents on a pound since yesterday but i don't know what particular good it will do me is that so said miss webster interestedly what is the reason i wonder they must be getting scarce in the market it is getting toward spring you know if that is so they will go higher still i'll tell mrs kedwin she may want to lay in a supply before they take another jump they will go higher ben said promptly that is mr perkins thinks so i heard him talking about it to mr wood just happened to hear it you know i wasn't interested i didn't suppose i cared but you see you do your item may save mrs kedwin several pennies oh things fit in where one least expects them to i've always found it so here is this poet whose acquaintance you are making tonight he will do for item number two and there is no telling when he may be useful to you ben laughed this was getting to be a very queer talk but he enjoyed it i don't know much about him he said if he is going to be useful to me i ought to know more than his name as to that said miss webster with a sigh there is not much to know about him that could be helpful except in the way of warning he was a genius who wasted his life when did he live ever so long ago asked ben oh no he belongs to this century has been dead only a few years died young too only thirty-eight and died in poverty and sorrow a scholar and a poet exclaimed ben in dismay yes indeed many a brilliant young man has been ruined by rum i hope you fight alcohol in whatever form you find it my friend a boy named benjamin should always be a foe to anything that can intoxicate i am said ben but his face looked troubled was this mr poe a drunkard poor fellow he was almost everything bad i do not know a sadder life belonging to a genius than the one he lived he must have been started wrong his father and mother were strolling play actors and both died when he was a little fellow then a rich man named allen adopted him that is where his middle name came from he was edgar allen poe you remember he was sent to school and had every opportunity and wasted them all he was expelled from the university for all sorts of disorderly conduct then he quarrelled with his adopted father and went off in anger to a foreign country he was going to be a soldier and do great deeds but he brought up in a police cell in st petersburg his long-suffering adopted father received him back and tried again and again to make a man of him and always failed at last his patience was exhausted and the poor idiot had to take care of himself for the remainder of his life it ended as i told you in a sorrowful death and he wrote beautiful poetry some of it is beautiful he was a genius and yet he was an idiot as i said how very strange ben said drawing a long sigh i did not know that people who had chances and and brains ever finished up in that way oh they do often the truth is life is full of such slippery places that the only chance worth thinking about is the one held out by the lord jesus christ those who lean on him are safe from falling and no others are well now you see you are slightly acquainted with edgar allan poe and with one of his poems all growing out of my tapping on the window-pane to-night and you don't know yet why i did it i have a picture for daisy has she framed her goose yet yes um said ben answering the smile in miss webster's eyes with a laugh my sister line framed it for her with some red paper that came around some of the things at the store 
did she tell you how troubled she was at first about hanging a goose in the study line told me said miss webster breaking into a merry laugh she is a dear little sister is that daisy i have a picture for her which i think she will like the child's face is not sweet like hers but it is pure and good and the lamb is very natural i took the liberty of framing it i hope daisy will not object as she spoke she drew a portfolio from the table and produced an engraving of a gentle-faced little girl with a kitten in her arms and a lamb at her side the picture was framed with a broad band of embossed gilt paper something altogether more elegant than anything daisy's collection could boast and yet entirely in keeping with her idea even ben exclaimed over the beauty of it she will like it so much he said eagerly i can't tell you how much she is a very queer little girl i don't know how she happens to have such odd notions she does not seem a bit like other little girls she is a flower said miss webster tenderly a lovely little wild wood flower that must not be spoiled by cultivation and yet must be trained so that it will bloom beautifully for the lord of the garden ben looked at her in respectful silence he did not quite understand this but he gathered that miss webster certainly thought their little daisy very sweet and now said that lady when she had carefully wrapped the picture in white paper tied it with a blue cord and addressed it to daisy isabel bryant with the love of the sender how does daisy isabel bryant's brother get on you have kept the promise you made me of course i've tried to said ben growing gloomy at once but i don't get on very well things are in a good deal of a muddle and that very thing muddles me more i believe then it is clearly your duty to tell me all about it because if i have helped make a muddle for you it stands to reason that i should try to help you out of it oh it isn't your fault said ben twisting in his chair and trying to smile only you see things in a fellow's life don't fit that sort of praying and he's got to live his life of course and it just makes things mixed up and miserable for nothing that is a grave statement and needs careful looking into i'm not sure we would agree as to the logic let us take it up in sections things in a fellow's life don't fit that sort of praying that is a statement of fact is it then of course i must accept it but the next he's got to live his life of course that i quarrel with from my standpoint i should say he hasn't got to do any such thing if the steps we took during that last talk were true and you and i agreed they were and that we would abide by them why then it is plain that this fellow's life must be changed to fit the praying that's easy to say declared ben sturdily resolved on being honest at whatever cost to his politeness but it isn't such a very easy thing to do i can tell you nobody promised that it should be easy my boy in fact we said nothing about that it was a secondary consideration of course after it had been once settled that a thing had got to be done do it easily if you can but do it anyhow is the motto of such a life when you have first settled that you ought there is no place for any such suppose there is never an ought when there is an honest cannot the two looked at each other steadily in silence for a few moments apparently miss webster had not the least idea of retreating from her position well said ben at last i don't see my way clear i know that is it something which you can tell me perhaps i can help you think it out why yes um he said after a moment's slightly embarrassed pause while the red on his cheeks grew deeper i could explain but there are other things which would have to be explained before you would understand you see the way of it is my father is dead and my mother has it all to do except what little we can do to help and there are some debts that were made when when 
he hesitated and miss webster came to the rescue i understand perfectly there are debts which your mother is trying to pay and which make it hard for her that is so often the case with a widow that it might almost be said to belong to most stories of life and you older ones want to help in every possible way so much is clear what then ben drew a long breath how well she had made it all sound and not a word had been said that reflected on his father's memory well the next thing is it is one of the meanest towns in the world for a boy to get work in i tramped through every street in it before i got this place in the grocery and i shouldn't have got it then if the boy who was there before hadn't broken his leg there are more boys than there are places you see or else there is very little doing i don't know what makes it but i know it is as much as a fellow's head is worth to get a place to earn anything in summer when the canning factory is open i can get work enough but that only lasts for a little while and it is a good while yet to summer but as i understand it you have a place in the grocery are you thinking about how hard it was to get it or borrowing trouble or what why you see said ben then he stopped to laugh maybe i am borrowing trouble at least i can see that something is coming i've either got to stop one thing or the other they sell hard cider at the grocery where i am well said miss webster looking steadily at him as he spoke these words in a significant tone and she waited for him to say more and the boys drink it some boys whose folks don't know it i guess and who can't afford the money for it if that were the only thing well said miss webster again some way he had not imagined that it would be so hard for her to understand why the fact is he said dashing into the subject now with all haste determined to make it very plain i'm an out-and-out -out temperance boy beer and cider and all of them i don't believe in sweet cider let alone hard but you don't have to sell cider do you no um he said speaking more slowly the troubled look coming back into his face that was what i thought all the time until i began to do this other thing that you wanted me to and for the life of me now i can't seem to make them match the praying and the living what if i don't sell it i'm there and the boys some of them come in to see me and after saying a few words to me they order a glass of cider and i look on and can't say a word because i don't suppose i have any business to preach against it when i'm in the employ of the man who sells it and i suppose some of the money he pays me comes from the cider barrel i was all right enough because i didn't drink it myself nor sell it to others until i began to pray that prayer you know and it doesn't seem to me the two can be made to match if ben had been looking at miss webster just then he would have seen a quick flash of pleasure come into her handsome eyes but he was looking at the floor i comprehend the situation i think she said at last after waiting for a minute to see if he had more to say but i don't think i understand where the perplexity comes in didn't i understand you to say you were in a muddle yes um said ben do things seem to you to fit and he gave her a furtive glance oh no but ben my boy are you really in a muddle as to which ought to be given up the praying or the business End of chapter nine chapter ten of miss d dunmore bryant by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten getting into close quarters this was bringing things down to a fine point or as i am afraid ben would have expressed it getting a fellow into close quarters he had no answer ready for her truth to tell he was a good deal surprised she had seemed so far from understanding him that he had some moments before reached the conclusion that she was not a very strong temperance woman 
and would perhaps think him a trifle silly for attaching so much importance to a few drinks of cider it was this thought which had increased his determination to stand by his colours but the tone of her question put to flight all such fancies as these it was only too evident what answer she expected him to make but what is a fellow to do he asked almost impatiently there are reasons why my mother ought to have the little bit i am earning not if you are earning it in a way that she would not like on which side of this question is mother my boy then did ben's eyes droop i haven't said a word to her he murmured at last she doesn't know anything about there being cider sold at the grocery she doesn't go to a grocery from one year's end to another she hardly ever even goes down that street on which side will she be ben when you tell her about it that was a very ingeniously put question how did miss webster find out that he was going to tell her about it but he answered her presently his tone still low she hates cider worse if anything than i do and she hates sin and wrong and compromise with conscience of any sort doesn't she no reply then presently in a cheery tone it seems to me benjamin bryant that you are trying to answer too many questions at once or to put the thought in another form trying to take certain steps before you reach them the first thing to do is to get away from this cider barrel that is if you are settled that the two do not match and i certainly understood that such was your deliberate opinion as to what you will do next of course you cannot answer that until the next thing comes there isn't any next thing there isn't another place in this town where a fellow can get any work i've been thinking about it all the week and i know there isn't more than that if i should leave mr sewell now when i've just got used to the work it would vex him of course and he wouldn't recommend me all of them steps with which you have clearly nothing to do my friend miss webster spoke with a quiet smile which was intended to be encouraging but some way it irritated ben that's easy enough to say he said pushing back his chair with a vim but you don't know anything about how hard things are why even little daisy realized the need for helping so much that she counted out her fifteen cents and cried because it wasn't more and because she didn't know how to help he added let us talk about daisy for a few minutes said miss webster suddenly you have reminded me of something which i wanted to ask you daisy told me about her dollies what is she going to do with so many i'm sure i don't know ben said a little astonished at the sudden change of subject he did not feel in the mood to talk about dolls but since miss webster did there was no help for him she fixes them in rows about the study as she calls it and tries to teach them a great many things but they are about as worthless a lot of creatures as ever sat around and did nothing we hardly know what to do with them in our little house it seems queer that so many dolls should have been sent to her when but there ben stopped he had almost said when we needed so many other things and didn't need dolls only one but if there was anything he hated it was parading their needs in any way miss webster laughed she tries to teach them does she that reminds me of my little sister faith she had a great many dolls they accumulated you know the circle of relatives was large and faith was a great pet with them all she clung to her dollies as treasures none of them seemed to wear out she was a most imaginative little creature always trying to teach her dollies what she had just learned herself your little daisy reminds me of her in many ways she doesn't look like her as you do like my brother but she has her sweet fanciful ways i must show you a picture of faith i have a great many one of father's pastimes was the taking of faith's picture in every imaginable attitude he had an amateur photographer's outfit there i see by your face that you are not quite sure what that means and want to know good for you 
that illustrates what i meant by picking up knowledge why the word amateur doesn't strictly belong to us it is stolen from the french partly and partly from the latin as so many of our words are there is a latin verb amare meaning to love and amateur is made up out of it and used to describe a person who loves a certain art or profession or study and pursues it when he can get a chance but does not earn his living by it or make it his life's work then i'm an amateur machinist i guess ben said with a little laugh are you are you fond of machinery we must have a talk about that well father took fay's picture one day when she was posing in the middle of her bed before she was dressed in the morning trying to teach half a dozen dolls a new figure in calisthenics ben looked puzzled and miss webster stopped to laugh you are fond of language at least she said not at all as though his curiosity troubled her that is a borrowed word again from two greek words one of them meaning beauty the other strength and the word itself is applied to an exercise of the body and limbs its object being to strengthen the muscles and teach grace of movement it is reduced to a science and is taught in most city schools nowadays faith had just learned some new movements and was teaching the dolls when my father opened the door he thought her position a graceful one and took a picture of her here it is isn't her face sweet where is your sister faith ben asked studying the pretty picture with one plump foot on tiptoe crossed over the other in heaven said miss webster gently faith is sure to be swift and graceful in her movements there i often think of her as intent on some sweet service for the king miss webster had the strangest way of talking about heaven ben thought the next moment she laughed merrily over the doe faces of two of the dollies they were pretty dolls she said but you see they did not take well in the picture they were shadow-struck or light-struck i suppose these are some of the terms which seem to belong to the profession i remember we asked father if the dolls would not sit still you wonder where my bright idea is don't you it has to do with still another picture father made a photograph of dollies one day all the dollies we could gather in the neighborhood i grouped them for a tableau and their pictures were sold at a child's fair which was held for the benefit of the orphan asylum they brought a good deal of money i thought of it when you called your sister's dollies worthless it is never safe to pronounce anything utterly worthless in this world my friend here's the picture did you ever see so many cunning dollies grouped together ben looked and laughed and admired it is the cutest picture i ever saw he said i should think it would have sold well what are they all about why there's one sewing they are doing all sorts of things said miss webster they represent the woman who lived in her shoe you know she had so many children she didn't know what to do that largest one isn't really a dolly at all but a little girl made to look like one she really sat in a large pasteboard shoe in the tableau but that didn't show in the picture they are at work getting their mother ready to go to the fair it was a very good likeness of nettie chalmers i presume that helped to sell the picture when i came across it the other day it made me think of your daisy's dollies why doesn't she go into business ben go into business said ben bewildered why how ma'am what do you mean couldn't a cunning little dolly store do well here don't you suppose besides the dolls a great many things could be made for them to wear dresses you know and bonnets and sacks and shawls ever so many cunning little creations your sister caroline could do such work beautifully i am sure and i have rolls of scraps just longing to be made up into dolly's wardrobes why couldn't you set daisy up as a saleswoman you say she wants to help mother i don't believe but this is a chance for her ben looked more astonished still but interested he laughed a little but it was over a fancy that he had as to what daisy might say 
the more he considered the plan the more it seemed to him a good one line could certainly do her part for he had often heard his mother say that she was very skilful with her needle and could do fancy work beautifully if there was any way to get her started but would people want to buy such things he said at last aloud speaking doubtfully he was so used to planning carefully about every purchase and cutting off what did not come under the head of necessities that it seemed strange to think of people spending money for dolly's and dolly's clothes oh yes said miss webster briskly some people would it is the only way they have of getting them there are girls who have plenty of money and plenty of leisure who could no more make a dress for their little sister's doll than they could build a house they haven't the talent and don't want to spend patient labor in acquiring skill oh i should think in a town of this size a very good custom could be worked up at that moment came a sound which turned their thoughts in a new direction a little clicking sound new to ben and curious he stopped in the midst of the question he was forming to listen to it do you think that is someone else tapping at the window she asked smiling that is a writing machine hasn't rufus told you about it he was very much interested in it for a few minutes i thought he might perhaps learn to work it but he didn't seem to care to he said he saw one ben answered eagerly and he tried to tell me how it went but i couldn't understand very well have you seen it miss webster does it really look like print and can he make it go as fast as rufus thought i don't know how fast rufus can think said miss webster smiling over ben's eagerness and his confusion of sentences but i know a way in which we might test it suppose you knock at that door for me and see if we cannot stop this racket and get a glimpse of the chief performer in much delight and some trepidation ben tiptoed across the room and did as he was told the tap-tap in the other room ceased a moment and the door between the rooms was opened revealing a young man with his hair somewhat rumpled and a pencil behind his ear good evening mr reynolds said miss webster cordially we hope you will excuse us for interrupting but i have a young friend here who is very eager to see that little wizard on which you play in such a manner that it can give you back your thoughts would it be too much trouble to bring it in here for our especial benefit not at all the young man said with great promptness it would give him pleasure to do that or anything else for miss webster and her friends so the little machine was seized with as much ease as though it had been a commonplace piece of furniture and set down on the table in miss webster's room she's a beauty mr reynolds said seating himself before her a regular beauty i've never worked one who behaved quite so well some of them get rather confused in their minds after being knocked about on the railroad for a few weeks especially if they are not carefully packed but this one is as clear-headed as she was on the day we left home did you ever see one work young man then we'll start her off mr reynolds spoke of the little creature as though she were alive and really it almost seemed to ben that she was he bent over her with parted lips and quick breathing amazed beyond measure when after the lapse of a few seconds the performer lifted the roller and revealed in neat print the words john quickly extemporized five tow bags you see said mr reynolds apologetically when ben read the line and miss webster laughed over it i'm in the habit of writing these words because they contain every letter in the alphabet and therefore it is a good sentence to learn on it is some time since i learned but the habit is upon me when i'm showing her off to give that sentence for the first one it is a suggestive sentence i'm sure laughed miss webster john was a remarkable boy if he could extemporize bags five of them at that ben did not hear her he was intent on the machine i don't understand he said where is the ink not a bit of ink about it mr reynolds declared enjoying the puzzled face then it isn't a self-inker but it prints with ink 
is that a ribbon running through there why it rolls itself up on those wheels and the ribbon is inked or colored or something i begin to understand but where are the type mr reynolds silently lifted the roller then the ribbon and pointed to the type with his finger at the same time going through a pantomime which told miss webster that he considered the boy's intelligence and curiosity worthy of response sit down to it he said heartily write your name and miss webster's name or write tau bags if you want to can't i get it out of order ben asked his face flushing with pleasure as he took the offered seat oh yes you can but you won't i've had boys look at it that i'd no more let try it than i would a polar bear at least unless i was on hand to guard it all the time but i have a notion that you are of a different stamp ben hardly heard the implied compliment he was at work trying to print his mother's name this after patient effort he accomplished to be sure it was spelled with a little b and he struck u for y at first making it bruant but he discovered his mistake in time to correct it and guessed out the way to move back the roller so as to do it what do you think of it mr reynolds asked watching his face as he looked up from this effort i can see that there's a chance to do fast work after a fellow once learned where the letters were i don't quite understand why they have put the a so far away though replied ben no more do i said mr reynolds significantly some time when you get to be an expert you must go down to the manufactory and see if you can find out miss webster there's a difference in boys as sure as the world i gave a young fellow of your acquaintance a chance to write his name one day and after struggling over it a while he said i don't see the use in learning this thing i can write my name enough sight faster with a pen both miss webster and ben laughed ben feeling sure in his heart that the boy was rufus it sounded so like him several more names were tried and then with a masterly effort ben struck off on his own account and wrote suddenly there came a rapping as of some one gently tapping tapping at my chamber door only that and nothing more this he showed to miss webster much elated because there were only two mistakes in the print that is well done mr reynolds said emphatically yes said miss webster so it is the gentleman had reference to the machine work but miss webster thought it was worth something to have remembered poe's lines so correctly having heard them but once you have a good memory she said to ben significantly yes said mr reynolds he has he recalls the position of the letters having once used them that shows he would make a rapid operator then ben and miss webster exchanged looks and smiles they understood each other i'll tell you what we'll do young man it was mr reynolds who was speaking we'll strike up a bargain if you say so to help each other i'm in need of a boy to do some roller work for me and in return for your services i'll teach you to write on that machine or let you teach yourself which is better that is if you have any leisure evenings i study evenings ben said i'm at work during the day and have to make what i can of my evenings but that would be study i think mother would be willing sir and i'm sure i should ben's eyes were so full of eager delight that he did not need to add those last words mr reynolds looking at the eyes laughed in a pleased way then we'll call it a bargain he said if mother is willing i shall only need you two evenings in a week i don't get ready for printing oftener than that but you may come up to my room and practice on the machine a little while each evening if you can manage the time and i really think it will pay you to do so then there was a tapping at miss webster's door and another caller was announced End of chapter ten chapter eleven of miss d dunmore bryant by pansy 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11. What's the Use? Good evening, said Miss Webster heartily, as the door opened in answer to her invitation, and revealed a tall gentleman. How fortunate! You are the very person I want most to see at this moment. How fortunate for me, said the newcomer, in a cheery voice, as he crossed the room with brisk step, and shook hands with Miss Webster. It cannot be because you are lonely, either. And he glanced interestedly, first at the two strangers, then at the machine on the table. Oh, no, it was because I wanted you to meet my friends. Let me introduce to you Mr. Reynolds of New York, the Reverend Mr. Holden, Mr. Reynolds. And this is my young friend, Benjamin Bryant. Ben, how do you do? said the cheery voice, and the boy who had imagined himself shy of all ministers felt his hand grasped in a hearty way, as though he had been an old friend. There followed as interesting a half-hour as Ben had ever spent in his life. Not only was Mr. Holden interested in the machine to such a degree that he asked numerous questions which Ben was longing to ask, but had not dared, but his own intelligent questions in regard to it drew out from Mr. Reynolds several important points. Besides, he was apparently, to that young man's great astonishment, interested in Ben himself. At least, he asked numerous questions, for which there could have been no other explanation. On the whole, it was in undisguised amazement, and some dismay, that he started up suddenly at the sound of the great clock on the corner, striking nine. "'Are you late?' Miss Webster asked, in answer to the dismayed face. "'Will your mother worry? I'm afraid we have been careless.' tell her it was all owing to the tapping of an old raven on the window-pane, instead of the chamber door. She will not be worried, said Ben, smiling over the raven, because I am sometimes kept at the store, and she knows I don't stay anywhere but where she would be willing to have me. But I was going to do some things this evening, and now it is gone. All the raven's fault, said Miss Webster cheerily, but perhaps it has not been a wasted evening. You have learned some things about the machine. Oh, no, indeed, said Ben eagerly. I have learned a great many things, and had a beautiful time. And I have learned that dried peaches have gone up in price and are going higher, said the lady merrily. Did you know that, Mr. Holden? I'm going to make a note of it to tell Mrs. Cadwin. I didn't know it. Mr. Holden said, in the same tone. Don't tell my landlady, please. Ben, my boy, come and see me some evening, will you? I live just around the corner in the stone house. I shall be very glad to have a chat with you about machines and any other interesting matter. Ben went away, smiling. Their tones were very merry, but there was nothing about either of them that suggested to him he was being made sport of. On the contrary, it seemed as though they were his intimate friends whom he had known a long time. He went home slowly, thinking about it all, happy also over the fact that Mr. Reynolds had said to him, the last thing before he took his machine away, "'Come in tomorrow evening, and we'll talk business.' That sounded delightful. Would his mother think he could spare the time to learn to work that splendid machine, he wondered? Of course it was not very probable that he could make the knowledge of use to him, not for years at least, but then who knew? He had a chance to do some of his thinking aloud. Just as he turned the corner which brought him in sight of home, Rufus Kedwin joined him. "'Where have you been all the evening?' he asked. "'I stopped for you to go to Jimmy Brower's with me, and they said you hadn't got home yet. Your mother said she supposed you were at the store,' but when I passed the store it was closed. "'Did you tell my mother so?' Ben asked, a note of anxiety in his voice. "'Why, no, I hadn't passed the store then, you know, but I did five minutes afterwards. Is that the game, Ben? You've been spending the evening somewhere where you would rather she wouldn't know?' Ben drew himself up proudly. "'Not unless your mother's house is such a place,' he said stiffly. "'My mother's house? Have you been to see me? 
that's great and i was in search of you and would enough sight rather have had your company than jimmy brower's but how came you to stay i wasn't there no said ben laughing in spite of his dignity over such a manifest truth you were not there i should say that was plain but neither was i not in your part of the house i was up in miss webster's room rufus gave a low whistle all the evening poor fellow what have you been about to get caught in such a scrape as that you had at least sixteen solemn lectures on the duties and responsibilities of life i'll venture i had a very pleasant evening said ben with emphasis he felt himself growing dignified again he had never liked rufus kedwin so little in his life as at that moment i think miss webster is one of the nicest and pleasantest women i ever saw he said after a moment's consideration as to how to put his thought oh of course she is pleasant as june weather a great deal of it and nice is no name for it mother thinks so too but honest ben don't you think she is rather rather well pokey you know or something of that kind preachy maybe that's the word for it a fellow can't go by her door seems to me without getting a touch of the importance of his opportunities or something of that kind well said ben if she tries to help a fellow to do a little thinking i shouldn't think it need to hurt him she hasn't said any more to me than mother does nor half so much but i saw some other people to-night i saw that writing machine you told about and mr reynolds and mr holden ben spoke as though the writing machine were one of the people and the first in importance it almost seemed so to him mr holden said rufus with a little start he's the last man i should want to see i don't like him anyhow what did you think of the machine it is the most wonderful thing i ever saw ben said heartily why don't you like mr holden i thought he was splendid oh because he meddles too much with other people's business never mind him he's nice enough for those who like him did you write any on the machine i wrote mother's name i'm going to learn to write on it that is if i can spare the time he offered me the chance he wants some work done and he says if i will give him two evenings part of the time i can write on the machine the other part and learn how isn't that a good chance hm said rufus a dirt cheap way of getting a fellow to work for you i should say of what earthly use does he suppose it will be for you to learn to write on that machine in two months at the latest he will take it away and you'll never see another and what good will your knowledge do you how do you know i'll never see another perhaps i'll have one of my own some day oh well perhaps i'll have a balloon and ride on it to the moon some day but i don't believe i will i don't either said ben with a good-natured laugh because you wouldn't know how to manage one if you ever had a chance to learn you would say what's the use and let it slip i know the difference between chances and shams i hope rufus said sharply i call this a sham to get a fellow to work for nothing he offered it to me and i let him know what i thought about it at least i hope he understood i think he did ben said significantly good night old fellow i'm at home and as the man in the paper said i wish you were just because you hate to walk alone so badly you know and have been walking out of your way to keep me company and ben went in at the kitchen door confirmed in his resolve to learn to run the writing machine if possible everything was quiet in the neat little study daisy was asleep in her bed but mrs bryant and line were sewing steadily line had a history open on the table beside her and occasionally glanced at the page as she sewed how late you are were mrs bryant's first words do they mean to keep you often as late as this at the store i left the store at seven o'clock or a little after ben said promptly and i haven't seen it since why what does this mean where have you been then 
there was a note of anxiety in the mother's voice despite her desire to trust her boy it was a wicked world and the town in which they lived held many boys who delighted to prowl around the streets of evenings she always felt that this was one of the roads to ruin was it possible that her ben might be dropping into it without even realizing it himself it was all on account of a raven tapping on the window said ben bursting into a merry laugh at least that was what miss webster said mother i wonder if you will understand her better than i did even before the mention of Miss Webster's name, Mrs. Bryant's face had cleared. No boy could come into his mother's presence with such a cheery, innocent laugh, who had been doing anything not just right. At least that was what she thought. Perhaps she had too high an opinion of boys. "'I don't know much about ravens,' she said, smiling. "'And you are talking in riddles. Have you been to call on Miss Webster?' "'Been there this whole evening.' she tapped for me you see on her window i couldn't think at first what the sound was that set us to talking about the raven tapping it is a poem did you ever hear of a poet named poe mother edgar allan poe said mrs bryant taking neat stitches in the shirt front oh yes i've heard of him and his raven never more there is nothing about the doleful creature to remind me of miss webster though i never heard of him said ben with that added note of respect in his voice which a boy cannot help feeling when he makes new discoveries in regard to his mother's fund of information she isn't like a raven i don't suppose she isn't like anybody that i ever saw before i've had the nicest time and late though it was he launched forth into a description of his evening a description in which the wonderful machine figured largely of course in the course of it he could not help contrasting his mother's views with those of rufus kedwin what do you think about it he asked a trifle anxiously having told her of the offer for some of his evenings why i think it is a grand opportunity she said with enthusiasm it will be a change of work and you will be learning to make yourself useful in a new way at the same time that you are acquiring a wonderful art for it really must be wonderful to write as fast as you describe but there isn't any likelihood that i can make it useful to me you know said ben still somewhat anxiously it was right that his mother should consider all the objections in the way i should have to own a machine if i ever earned any money in that way and they are terribly expensive just think a hundred dollars of course i shall never have one of my own how do you know that his mother asked the question so coolly that it almost took his breath away why mother he said and stopped she glanced up at him and quietly smiled it is impossible to tell what may happen in this world she said cheerily a great many wonderful things have happened even to me once when i was a little girl and had an opportunity to learn how to harness a horse i said what's the use in learning i shall never have a horse to harness but i learned and because i did i had a chance to save a child's life oh it is a long story too long for to-night i'll tell you about it some time but it is one of the things which taught me to learn all i could in any proper direction and be ready when the opportunity offered to put it in practice you may never have a writing machine it is true but then again you may stranger things than that have come to pass my son since you don't know any certain future get ready for a possible one that is my rule i'm glad of it said ben with great heartiness it is just exactly what i wanted to do but i didn't know but you would think it foolish you ought to hear rufus kedwin go on about it he hasn't your ideas i can tell you mother i wish he could hear you talk sometimes that boy needs something i wonder if his mother i suppose there are as great differences in mothers as in anything else these pieces of sentences thrown out in jerks set line into a bubble of laughter why ben she said what's the matter 
i should think it was a sphinx instead of a raven you had visited with to-night by the bits of wise sentences you toss out i should think there was a difference in mothers if you mean mrs kedwin and mother softly softly warned mrs bryant well but mother interrupted ben just as line was about to speak rufus does have such queer ideas and it seems as if but he broke off again a dim idea that his mother would not approve of his saying that it seemed as though rufus would have been better had he been better managed by his mother held back his sentence to line he said when they were down cellar together getting some forgotten potatoes for morning did it ever strike you that rufus had pretty low-down notions about what folks do or what they might do it has struck me that he has rather low-down notions about a number of things ben what do you mean in particular but just then a gust of wind blew the light out and ben did not explain it occurred to him afterwards as a strange thing that in the excitement of telling about the machine and the offer and the minister he should have forgotten all about the subject which was troubling him so much when mrs webster tapped on her window it did not enter his mind again until the next morning when he was skimming along the street on an errand for the store just as he turned into dane street a little fellow with his satchel of books on his shoulders making a cross cut across the pond for school fell at full length he did not seem to be hurt and it was a common enough occurrence ben halting a moment to see that the boy was being helped up would have dashed on and thought no more about it but for a sentence which caught his ear from a rough-looking boy standing by ha ha i guess he's been to seawall's and got a drink of his cider this morning and it has made his legs tipsy a coarse laugh followed those coarse words and ben as he hurried on felt the hot blood mounting to his very forehead seawall's was the store where he spent his days in hard work i don't believe i'll stay there another day he muttered i'll talk to mother anyhow end of chapter eleven